Welcome, everybody. I'm glad that you're here tonight on Wednesday night midweek Bible study, Aberdeen First Baptist Church. If you're at home joining us on a live stream, welcome. Glad that you are there as well for our study in Daniel. And we're in chapter 8 tonight. So if you want to go ahead and find that on your device or in the Bible uh, that you have, if you still carry a printed copy around, um, not many people do. Oh, good. Um, so do I. So, uh, yeah, find chapter 8, and uh, we're going to dig into Daniel's second vision that he had. Let's pray first. Father, thank you for the joy of the day. We thank you for uh, the grace, the mercy that we have had all day long in you. No matter how our day has been, maybe it's been really hectic. And this is the first time we've had a chance to stop and breathe. Um, or maybe it's been relaxing, Lord, whatever it may have been. Uh, we know that we have uh, been graced with your love through it all, that, uh, Lord, you are consistent in your kindness toward us in Christ, and we're so grateful. So, Lord, we ask that you be with us at this time now as we continue to study this marvelous book, uh, these visions that you gave to your servant Daniel and what it meant to him and his time, but what it continues to mean. And, Lord, the message that we draw from it even now. And we thank you for it. So give us wisdom and give us insight. Help me as I lead and, and, and teach. But Lord, let it be your words that are communicated. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. All right. Chapter 8 of Daniel is um, a little different. You're going to see some similarities to what we just covered in chapter 7 with the vision, some of the imagery. But on the other hand, it's not like chapter 7. It's, it's got a lot of differences, and it doesn't cover quite the, the scope that chapter 7 did. 7 was very expansive and um, took us to the end of time, really, to the rise of the Antichrist. Chapter 8 doesn't do this. It has a, a different kind of focus. So let's, um, let's read the first 14 verses. It breaks out really neatly. The first half of the chapter is what Daniel sees, the second half of the chapter is the angel coming to him and giving him some interpretation of what he had seen. So let's read the first part, verses 1 through 14. In the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, a vision appeared to me, Daniel, after that which appeared to me at the first. And I saw in the vision, and when I saw, I was in Susa, the citadel, which is in the province of Elam. And I saw in the vision, and I was at the uh, Uli Canal. I raised my eyes, and I saw, and behold, a ram standing on the bank of the canal. It had two horns, and both horns were high, but one was higher than the other, and the higher one came up last. I saw the ram charging westward and northward and southward. No beast could stand before him, and there was no one who could rescue from his power. He did as he pleased, and he became great. As I was considering, behold, a male goat came from the west across the face of the whole earth without touching the ground. And the goat had a conspicuous horn between his eyes. He came to the ram with the two horns, which I had seen standing on the bank of the canal, and he ran at him in his powerful wrath. I saw him come close to the ram, and he was enraged against him, and struck the ram and broke his two horns. And the ram had no power to stand before him, but he cast him down to the ground and trampled on him. And there was no one who could rescue the ram from his power. Then the goat became exceedingly great, but when he was strong, the great horn was broken, and instead of it there came up four conspicuous horns toward the four winds of heaven. Out of one of them came a little horn, which grew exceedingly great toward the south, toward the east, and toward the glorious land. It grew great even to the host of heaven. And some of the host and some of the stars it threw down to the ground and trampled on them. It became great, even as great as the prince of the host, and the regular burnt offering was taken away from him, and the place of his sanctuary was overthrown. 
and a host will be given over to it together with the regular burnt offering because of transgression, and it will throw truth to the ground, and it will act and prosper. And I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to the one who spoke, For how long is the vision concerning the regular burnt offering, the transgression that makes desolate, and the giving over of the sanctuary and host to be trampled underfoot? And he said to me, For two thousand three hundred evenings and mornings, then the sanctuary shall be restored to its rightful state. So that's the vision that Daniel had, his second one. So just a little bit of context here. This is occurring in the third year of Belshazzar in the year 550 BC. So that puts Daniel at about 70 years old. So that also means, again, like chapter 7, um, it's going to be before chapter 5. Uh, but it says that Daniel is having uh, the vision in Susa. In other words, he's in the vision himself. He's in this uh, sort of important city of Susa, which is located all the way to the east, in the eastern part of the empire. So it's like 220 miles east of Babylon. It's about 150 miles north of the Persian Gulf. So it's about as far east in the Babylonian empire you could, you could go. And in his vision, this is, this is where he is. Um, anybody else recognize anybody the, the city of Susa? Any other biblical allusions who might have been there? Who's that? No, no, people. Any people that were there. You remember? This is where Esther was. This is also where Nehemiah was. And, and you'll find references to Susa at the beginning of both of those books. So you can see how these kind of connect in that time frame. So again, it's about 10 years before uh, the events that happened in chapter 5, the handwriting on the wall when Belshazzar's reign came to an end in 539. This is still chronologically uh, before that. Okay, so the vision itself. Let's talk about the vision. Uh, first of all, uh, it consists of three characters. There's just kind of three parts to this vision. It isn't really elaborate or complicated. So you have a ram, and it's described as having two horns that grow out of it. And the one that grew last, or in this case, second, would be last, it, it, grew, it grew larger than the other one. Now, the significance of that, it should remind you again of that bear that seemed lopsided. Remember the bear in the last chapter? Possibly there's a connection. Uh, we're going to see, Gabriel's going to give us the interpretation, so there's no mystery here of who the ram is, but it's described as running in every direction from the east. You know, it, was, it was described as running to the west, to the north, to the south, not to the east because that's where it's coming from. So, but as it goes, um, it just had all of this power and it's just trampling everything. Nobody could stop it. So again, you're familiar with that kind of imagery. It means it's powerful, it's having dominion, it's subduing everyone around it. And that certainly would describe um, what it's describing, as we'll see. Then you have this goat. It's a funny looking little goat. I've seen goats. I've never seen one with just one horn between its eyes. It's a unicorn. Yeah. So a unicorn goat. So this unicorn goat comes in on a rainbow. No, there's no rainbow. But, but you've got this unicorn goat. Really strange. It, it, it's described as moving really fast in the sense that it's not touching the ground. That would be an image of it, of it going swiftly, almost as if it's flying along the ground. It doesn't even hardly touch the ground because it's going so fast. Uh, you imagine cartoons. Y'all have seen cartoons where the little guy winds up and takes off and he's going so fast his feet hardly touch the ground. That's kind of what I imagine of this little goat. Uh, it destroys uh, the, the ram. So it charges the ram with its one strong horn and, and, and breaks it. Uh, but then we see in the vision that the horn that was so strong is broken and four horns um, replace it. Uh, which is interesting. Now, some of this should, this imagery should sound a little familiar to the last chapter. 
some of the things about the horns and one being bigger than the other and the four coming out of the one and that type of thing. So we'll, we'll talk more about that. But the most intriguing thing in this vision is, is the little horn. There's this little horn again that grows out of the fourth. In other words, we get the most description about this. So obviously this is the focus of the vision, this, this little horn. The rest of it is just sort of setting up for what's going on with, with this one. So it, it grows, and it says it grows toward the south, towards the east, and the glorious land, the beautiful land um, itself. So it's coming south and it's going east which would seem to indicate that it's either coming from the north or the west or the northwest or coming from that direction. It's described as throwing down the hosts and stars. If you go on down to verse 24, which we haven't got to yet, but we're going to, this would seem to indicate uh, the saints of God as it's described a little bit later there in verse 24. But it's throwing those things down. It's, it's being described with great power with a lot of, of, of hyperbole. Um, it becomes great. It throws down the, the prince of hosts. Now, I think later on in the interpretation, this little horn is described as even trying to rival God. Here, I think it might be a more, uh, because of the context of what is around it, it might be talking about the high priest uh, of Jerusalem himself, throwing him down because of what comes next. It talks about taking away the regular burnt offerings. So now we're getting more specifics about Judaism, you know, the Jewish culture, religion, overthrows the sanctuary, you know, the temple. Uh, interesting enough, throws truth to the ground. Isn't that interesting? If truth could be trampled on and thrown to the ground, this little horn's even gonna do that. Uh, so you see, it's more than just conquering, it's, it's doing some really unusual things. And then it's described as, as prospering and all this horrible stuff that he does. Um, it doesn't mean that it's good in the sense of prospering. It just means he's acting in these horrible, blasphemous ways, but being able to do it and no one can, can stop him. The last thing it mentions is this goes on for 2,300 evenings and mornings. So it's an interesting expression, 2,300 evenings and mornings. And there's some debate about, well, what does exactly that mean? Does it mean 2,300 days? You know, you have an evening and a morning, but usually in the Bible, if it's mentioning days, like in the creation account, you put morning first, then evening. It's, it's reversed here. Or in context, does this um, refer to the evening and morning sacrifices because there is a lot of context here about the sanctuary about the burnt offerings so that was the tradition so is that what it's talking about well I think in the end if either one you go with is inconsequential to the overall message of what's happening here the reason that number is given is because in the vision we're going to see there's this is going to be horrible but it has an end it has a number you know, it's, it, it comes to an end and it's already predetermined by God. So if it's maybe um, only literally 1,150 days, then it might be referring to that date between about 168 to 164 BC, roughly a three and a half year period. If it's more literal, uh, 2,300 days, then we're probably talking about 170 to 164 you know, almost seven years or so, close to it, uh, especially if you're on a lunar calendar, 28 days in a month. Um, so both of these, either way you do it, these dates are significant, and, and, and you'll see that in a minute. Um, but mainly what it does is it tells us that there's a limited time in which um, this little horn is going to wreak its havoc, okay? Then we go on to... Uh, the interpretation. So the second half, let's read, well, we'll read down through verse 25. So beginning at verse 15, when I, Daniel, had seen the vision, I sought to understand it. And behold, there stood before me one having the appearance of a man. And I heard a man's voice between the banks 
of the Lue, and I called Gabriel, it called Gabriel, make this man understand the vision. So he came near where I stood, and when he came, I was frightened, and I fell on my face. But he said to me, understand, O son of man, that the vision is for the time of the end. And when he had spoken to me, I fell into a deep sleep with my face to the ground, but he touched me and made me stand up. He said, Behold, I will make known to you what shall be at the latter end of the indignation, for it refers to the appointed time of the end. As for the ram that you saw with the two horns, these are the kings of Media and Persia, and the goat is the king of Greece. And the great horn between his eyes is the first king. As for the horn that was broken in place of which four others arose, four kingdoms shall arise from his nation, but not with his power. And at the latter end of their kingdom, when the transgressors have reached their limit, a king of bold face, one who understands riddles, shall arise. His power shall be great but not by his own power. And he shall cause fearful destruction and shall succeed in what he does and destroy mighty men and the people who are the saints. By his cunning, he shall make deceit prosper under his hand. And in his own mind, he shall become great. Without warning, he shall destroy many. And he shall even rise up against the prince of princes and he shall be broken but by no human hand all right so this is the first instance of um, gabriel in the scripture of, of the angel who comes and will give daniel some interpretation so daniel or, or gabriel comes uh, there's a voice um, presumably the voice of god instructing Gabriel to explain some things to Daniel. So the first thing we need to consider is that the vision is for, like verse 17 says, for the time of the end. In verse 19, it's repeated, refers to the appointed time of the end. So what does that mean? This is a vision to tell you about the time of the end or the appointed time of the end. And one thing we might jump to if we're not careful is we might jump to that eschatological the the end of time you know like we saw in chapter seven that ultimate the antichrist is coming before christ returns and everything is finished but here that is not what that's talking about this is referring back to those specific 2300 evenings and mornings the period of time in which this little horn is going to do what it does. So in other words, this is a vision telling you about that time period that will come to its conclusion. It will come to its end. It has an appointed time for an end. So Daniel 8 is really, you might consider, a closed vision. It's something that has completely already happened. There's nothing in chapter 8 that we're looking at forward to like we did with chapter 7 okay and we'll understand this as we move along um, he tells us that the ram and it shouldn't be a surprise is the is is media and persian it's the medo persian empire um, we probably guessed that because the one horn was bigger than the other uh, the, per the medes came first but the persians came along and became greater as time went on uh, we saw that with the bear, that possibly it, you know, had one side greater or bigger than the other. May have also indicated that as well in chapter 7. Uh, so we know that that was actually on the cusp of beginning when Daniel has this vision. It's still a few years away. It hasn't happened yet. It hasn't started. And um, maybe even Daniel could kind of see it coming, but it hadn't actually happened yet. Because Belshazzar, the Babylonian king, is still on the throne during this vision but this next one certainly was pretty far ahead for daniel because the goat is is described well not is said is identified as the king of greece the king of greece 
which hadn't happened yet and wasn't going to happen for a while. And the great horn is identified as its first king. And we know who that was. <laughs> He's pretty well known, uh, Alexander the Great. So that horn is identified as the very first king of the goat, when the goat is, is the people of, of Greece. Now, it's very interesting, too, in verse 23, it talks about when the transgressions have reached their limit, when this stuff is going to happen, and you wonder, well, what is that a, a reference to? Because it's a little vague, isn't it? Well, whose transgressions? What did they do? Who, what's it talking about? And what's the limit? And um, I think it may be referring to in context, both in what we read here in chapter 8, but also what we know historically that we're going to get to. Uh, it might be talking about the Jews themselves, uh, that when their compromise, when their Hellenization had become so great, and we're going to talk about what that means because we're talking about the country of, of Greece now. Um, or it may be talking about what the Jews had reached their transgressions, but also uh, the Greek leaders had reached theirs as well. It could be both of them, that there was this sort of tipping point in which all of this was going to begin to happen now. And uh, so that's, that's very interesting. And the little horn uh, is, it's very clear if you know the history and you see the description here, and we've mentioned this name Antiochus Epiphanes before, uh, it's very clear to every biblical and ancient scholar and commentator that this is who the little horn is uh, in chapter 8. It refers to this particular Greek ruler that would come after Alexander, that would come to have a devastating impact on the Jewish people uh, in the Palestine region. Okay? Now, again, that's not too complicated, but it's good for us to understand some, some history that, that goes along with this vision. So we're talking about some things that were unfolding during what we call the intertestinal period, okay, between the testaments, between uh, the events recorded in the Old Testament, the events recorded in the New Testament. It's about 400 year gap or so. So the happenings in this vision in Daniel 8 are happening during that time, part of that time at least, when uh, the Persians kind of dominate the region and the Greeks come on the scene and then we have this um, terrible conflict between a particular Greek ruler, um, Antiochus, and the Jewish people. So I don't want to bore you with a bunch of history, although history's not boring. Right? All right, good, all right, all right, I got history fans, good deal. Well, uh, it begins with Philip. Philip of Macedon is the, and you have to, when you think of, I know it's when you go to textbooks or you Google it or, you know, this empire started at this date, the next one took over here, you know, almost like they were just like giving each other the keys to the house and taking turns. It, it's never that simple, you know, that one is emerging and challenging while another one's on the decline. You know, there's overlap, you know, so nothing is ever that clear cut. Uh, there, there's a lot going on at any one time. But while, you know, Babylon is happening especially now while the, the Persians are sort of dominating the region, you got this guy named Philip over in Greece. And he's beginning to kind of bring Greek nobles and leaders together to resist the Persians. Because the Persians, of course, have attacked them. You know, you've probably seen movies where the Persians invade Sparta and Greece, you know, these places. You know, that kind of thing's been going on. So they're, the Greeks are beginning to organize and develop confederations to try to resist the Persians because the Persians are just dominating the whole area. Um, and Philip is key to that. And the reason I mentioned Philip is because that's Alexander's dad. Okay, so that's Alexander's dad. So when Philip um, dies, uh, pretty sure he got murdered. When in doubt, just say they got murdered because it's probably true. Uh, but Alexander is... He's only 19 years old when, when his dad dies, and he had already been commanding his dad's armies. 
And uh, so he, he's an overachiever. But he begins to set out to, to not just defend Greece from the Persians, but he's going to go get them. He goes on the offensive. And now he is going to push out as the Medo-Persian Empire is fading. Okay, it's fading. All empires fade eventually. America should remember that. They all do over time. And uh, so he's, he's pushing out. And by 331, he, he's conquered the Persians. And he has um, conquered very swiftly. I remember Alexander was the goat who doesn't even touch the ground, just flying along. Remember Alexander, the Greek empire, was the one that was in chapter 7, the, the leopard with four wings, you know, could move so fast. And, and it's very much accurate to the way he conquered. Um, he was sort of like Blitzkrieg before the Germans ever thought of it. You know, he, he moved very quickly across that territory and he conquered. Now, he did some other things, though, as he conquered that are significant. You've got to understand this to understand what was going on with Antiochus. Is as he conquered militarily, he also had a strategy for what we call Hellenization. Okay, and that's a weird word. I don't know if you've ever heard that word before, but it comes from the Greek word Hellas, which is the Greek word for Greece. <laughs> okay, so you might say he spread uh, Greecism. You know, he, you know, what it means to be Greek is kind of what he was spreading. So he, he didn't just conquer and then leave it alone. He, he tried to change culture. He, he, tried to, he tried to unite his empire by, by forcing culture on people as well. And typically he would do things like um, establish Greek-type cities uh, with all of their features. He began to demand that you know, the, the empire's language would be Koine Greek. It would be Greek that everyone would communicate in officially. You know, so people had to start learning Greek in addition to what else they, they spoke. You imagine it's sort of like what happened when the British Empire, you know, you know, basically circled the globe and colonized so many places. And that's why wherever you go, most places, they're speaking English as a second language in so many places. That's what was going on here. Uh, but Alexander was, it wasn't just a byproduct, it was intentional. He was, he was demanding these things and introducing Greek religion and philosophy and, and culture and all of these kinds of things. And the reason this is important to the story is because when, when they brought this into Judea and began to, to enforce this on Jews, it didn't fly <laughs> with most. It was a real point of tension not just a tension between these Greek rulers and the Jews, but it began to divide Jews themselves because some were beginning to sort of get with the program, like, okay, you know, the Greeks are in charge, we'll do what the Greeks do. And some Jews were, no, you know, we're going to resist this to our last dying breath. And so it, it put Jew against Jew as well. Um, but if you think about why the New Testament is written in Greek, it's because of Alexander. Okay, so you, you understand just how far-reaching and impactful his conquest was. He didn't last long as the ruler, though, just like the, just like the vision that, that one mighty horn was broken. And so in 323, he died, and his empire fell into this real chaotic power struggle. And eventually, you know what happened, don't you, by now? How many parts did it get divided into? Four, yeah, we got four wings and heads and four horns. And so we got all kinds of clues that what came after Alexander was going to be a tetrarchy. It was going to be four different divisions of his kingdom. And just like in this vision, none of those kings would be as strong as he was, which was absolutely true. Uh, they were all wannabes. None of them were going to be like, like Alexander. Now, for our biblical purposes, two of those dynasties became really important. There was one dynasty that settled and controlled uh, the region of Egypt, south of Palestine. That was the Ptolemy 
dynasty. So they were down in Egypt. The Seleucid, and each of those are named after their first king, okay? That's where the names come from. The Seleucids, where Antiochus is going to come from, they were headquartered in Syria and then extended east. So they were sort of west um, of Palestine and north and, and then on to the east. So, so you can just imagine geographically where Jerusalem is. It's between those two. <laughs> okay? So they've got the Ptolemies to their south. They've got the Seleucids to their north and their east. And they're caught in the middle between these two rivaling kingdoms. Um, and so often, as the Jews were, where they're geographically located, that's a major um, thoroughfare. Everybody wants to at least, they may not want to live there, but they want to control it because it's important uh, for trade, commerce, travel, all these kinds of things. And that's been the history of Israel in that area. Uh, so those two, and um, Antiochus is going to come out of this context. Now, you also have to remember that now, during this period, you also have Rome that's beginning to emerge. So even farther west, there's this city of Rome that's beginning to build and get stronger, and that eventually is going to displace uh, these smaller Greek kings as well. They haven't showed up yet, but they're going to show up. By the time we get to Jesus' day, they've shown up, right? <laughs> the Romans are there. So, so it's not like they're, they're not there. They're just, they haven't arrived in the area yet, um, but they're, they're coming soon. All right. Antiochus, he was called Antiochus IV. Um, he took on the name Epiphanes, uh, which means illustrious one. Uh, actually, on some of the coins that he had made about himself, it actually said Theos Antiochus Epiphanes, um, Antiochus the illustrious God. <laughs> so he thought pretty well of himself, which, which kind of goes along with the vision. He was going to rival God himself, at least in his own mind, and, and that's very much who he was. I love that the Jews used to play on words. They called him Antiochus Epinemes, which means the mad one, <laughs> not, not the illustrious one. They, they didn't think well of him. They thought he was nuts, and maybe he was. Um, it's also a time period with this Hellenization. You know what that is, making you Greek, taking on that culture. It's really polarizing Jew against Jew. Um, and there was a real struggle at this time of who was going to be high priest of the temple. So it was becoming a very corrupt time. Antiochus is, is exerting his influence into the area. Some Jews are becoming more corrupt and, and seduced by this Greek way of life. And now people are paying money to become the high priest. There's a guy that becomes the high priest who's not even of the priestly descent but he pays Antiochus enough money that Antiochus puts him in place. You can see what's going on here. So, so they're really in Jerusalem itself. It's, it's kind of on edge. Uh, and these, these, these people are, I mean, you think of Jews. They're, they're very modest. They're very religious. Um, they're very, they've got their traditions. They have the temple there. They've got the synagogues. And now, you know, they're building, you know, Greek markets, they're building Greek gymnasiums. They built a Greek gymnasium right near the temple. And I don't know if you know what the word gym, actually the root, the Greek means. Anybody know? Would you want to say so? It, it, it means naked. And it was very common that the men who competed and trained at these gymnasium stuff were naked. Now, that, that's, that doesn't fly with Jews, <laughs> you know. And, and so, I mean, it was a real clash of cultures, religion, everything going on at this time. And there's this struggle for the control of the religion. There's a struggle for control of the temple, the very heart of Jewish religion. And after Antiochus puts a guy in there that's his guy, and not a real, not really shouldn't, he shouldn't be there. Um, Antiochus is away fighting in Egypt, you know, because they're fighting each other. And there, there's this rumor that he got killed. It was just a rumor. It wasn't true, but it emboldened the Jews in Jerusalem. And they, they actually ousted the, the priest and put in their own, 
Well, when he hears about this, he takes that as a rebellion and he attacks Jerusalem. He sends in his army in 168 BC and attacks Jerusalem. Uh, now again, this is the vision coming true. This is the little horn that Daniel saw the vision about. He shows up, he attacks Jerusalem and it is devastating. Uh, records indicate he killed tens of thousands of Jews, men, women, children. He offered a pig on the altar in Jerusalem to his god, Zeus, uh, or Jupiter, depending on if the Greek or Roman name, put up a statue of Zeus, um, put in his own priest back in. He outlawed Sabbath observance. He outlawed circumcision for the Jews. He destroyed the scriptures where he can find them. He tortured Jews. He enslaved Jews. It was horrendous. You really can't overstate how bad this was, apparently, for the Jews. It was devastating. He went on to um, have a pretty heavy hand from that point on there in Jerusalem and in Judea. He even required that Jews show their allegiance to him um, by going into towns and villages and making you know, heads of households come out and sacrifice a pig to Zeus in his officials, you know, in their military's presence. Uh, can you imagine going in and asking devout Jews to come out and slaughter a pig and offer it as a sacrifice to a pagan god? On the penalty of death, if you don't. So again, that's horrible, but you can imagine some of them were doing it. I mean, if people came, if, if they showed up in this room right now and gave us some sort of horrible option like that, how many of us would do it to save our skin or save our family? I don't know. I'm not going to look around the room and say, yeah, probably you. But um, I don't know about myself. I guess you, you don't know until that actually happens. Um, so again, you've got Jews looking at each other. And now they're, they're saying, you know, are you a patriot or are you a traitor? And you got all this terrible stuff happening. And eventually, this will spark a rebellion. Um, the Maccabean Revolt, it's, it's called. And, and you can, there's, you know, there's writings about it. You can actually read the history of, of what happened here. Um, it, it started with this incident of, the officials coming in to this one town outside of Jerusalem. It wasn't in Jerusalem. It was a more rural area. And it was an older man by the name of Matthias. And they basically said, you're going to come out for your family. You're going to offer the pig. And there was a Jewish official there and the, the Greek authority. And Matthias refused. And he killed the Greek authority. And he killed the Jew who were trying to pressure him to do it. And then him and his five sons ran and hid. And his sons led what was called the Maccabean Revolt, named after one of the sons, Judas, whose nickname was uh, the Maccabee, which means the hammer, which is pretty cool. Um, and, and they just operated with guerrilla warfare, basically. They just, and they persisted for quite some time until they actually did win some of the Jewish independence back and they rededicated the temple in 164 BC. Um, and that is where the Jews have the celebration of Hanukkah. That's where Hanukkah comes from. It's, it's a celebration of that event, of when the temple was cleansed and rededicated after Antiochus had, had desecrated it. Um, so that, that's kind of you know, the history that lines up with the vision that Daniel had. Uh, and it's amazing. Now, skeptics say, remember, we've been talking about the skeptics who say, well, this was written, you know, in the second century after all these things happened. Now, what have we said to that? Hogwash, right? Yeah, we, we believe that Daniel wrote this. He wrote it in the sixth century. He wrote this 400 years before these things happened. And, and again, it's just a testimony to the accuracy of Scripture and prophecy in scripture that what's described in that vision with the ram and the goat and the little horn was incredibly accurate. And there's no doubt that it ultimately pointed 
um, to uh, Antiochus uh, Epiphanes. Now, other parts of Daniel point to more future events, point to someone like Antiochus, but even greater and even farther down the road. Um, let's get the last two verses and we'll finish up here. Where chapter 8 ends, 26 and 27. The vision of the evenings and the mornings, there's that repetition, evenings and the mornings. In other words, that time period of the little horn that has been told is true, but seal up the vision for it refers to many days from now. See, it hasn't happened yet. And I, Daniel, was overcome and lay sick for some days. Then I rose and went about the king's business, but I was appalled by the vision and I did not understand it. So just a couple of observations about that. Um, it repeats that this is about evenings and mornings of verse 14. Again, this time of intense persecution by the little horn, which I believe we're thoroughly convinced was Antiochus and something that has already happened back there in the second century BC. And then Daniel records at the end that this vision really disturbed him because he still didn't understand a lot about it. Now you gotta think of it from his point of view. We're looking back and we're filling in all the blanks because it's already happened from where we sit. But for Daniel it hadn't, so he still didn't know who it was gonna be or exactly how it was gonna happen. There was still a lot of it that was a mystery to him. Even though Gabriel had given him some pretty good interpretation, there was still a lot that he would not have known himself. And so he says, it made me sick <laughs> for a few days. And um, that he was really disturbed by it as well. But it also says he finally got up and went back to work uh, there in the palace. All right, so let's talk about some takeaways. Uh, and, and there's some good ones here. There really are. You might say, well, that's interesting, but <laughs> what do you take away from that um, other than understanding history a little better? But I think there's some good ones. I think you have to realize that sometimes evil is allowed to prosper. Did you notice that? You know, that these evil, brutal kings would be allowed to prosper and they would do okay. And they always seem to overstep themselves with God. These, these type of men, these type of rulers, which will always lead to ultimate judgment and destruction. So sometimes God in his providence is allowing evil to prosper. Uh, that, that's an important takeaway, I think. Uh, the little horn there in chapter 7 and 8 allow us to see the truth of the reality of both Antichrist types and the Antichrist that's still going to come. It, it's really not an either or. And, and this is confirmed in scripture that there are going to be these types of antichrists that remind us of the one that's going to come. And they still are propelled by the same demonic power. And they're going to arise in history. They have arisen in history. More may arise in history. We don't know. But we can see the, the typology in Antiochus. He is clearly a type of the Antichrist to come that's going to persecute. It reminds me of 1 John 2, 18, where John says, children, it is the last hour, and as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, the Antichrist, so now many Antichrists have come. And right there, John says it. Therefore, we know that it is the last hour. I don't know, but I, I think as the end approaches, ever how long that's going to be, I think there are going to be more and more antichrists <laughs> with a small a. Uh, these, the, the, this evil is going to continue and, and you're going to see these, these kinds of, of men and leaders and tyrants and things that are going to do in, incredible evil. And, and you could probably list some right now, even in modern time. You, you could list some of these types who point us toward this ultimate evil that's still to come. And then one other I would mention is that God's providence rules over and through, um, I should say, the evil of mankind and Satan. That's a tough one. There's been so much evil 
we, we just read about a horrific time in the nation of Israel. So much evil. Antiochus was, was a madman. He was evil. Um, Herod's going to come along in just a little while. <laughs> Herod's just around the corner. Herod the Great. And that guy was just off his rocker. He was crazy cruel. You know, so there's been so much evil. And there still is so much evil. And there's still so much that Satan is doing. Um, because he hates humanity. He hates God. He hates the, the people of God particularly. But even though there's been so much evil by men, by Satan, and it's going to continue until Christ returns, it doesn't mean God's lost control somehow. Somehow, for his purposes, for his glory, in his providence, he is still working in and through even that evil. He hasn't caused it. It's not on him. He's not causing it to happen, but he's working through it. He's allowing it, and there's purpose in it. And that is really hard for us to see, especially if it affects you, especially if it affects people you love, your people, your tribe. That's really hard to see, but it calls us back once again to faith, to say that this is true, though, in, in spite of what may be in front of me or what I'm seeing or what I'm experiencing. This is true. God is in control of these events. One of the reasons for apocalyptic literature in the Bible was to give the people of God just that kind of assurance. You read the book of Revelation, it's horrible. I mean, my goodness. But, but there's so much hope in it too, right? There's so much hope that God's in control and when he's ready to do it, he's going to judge all of this evil and he's going to make every wrong right. I'm going to leave you with a quote and we'll be done. I like Sinclair Ferguson's. He's one of the commentaries I'm reading as I go through this. And I, this quote, as I read it earlier, really stood out to me. And he was kind of summing up this chapter and kind of what we learned from it. He said, we know that God will bring history to a conclusion. It has direction and purpose that is fully revealed in Christ. Isn't that true? With such confidence, we can speak boldly and plainly to the darkness and confusion of our times. We do not know everything, but we know something that those who are apart from God do not know or understand. And that's so true. We talk about the difference the people of God have from people who don't have God and what they know and what they can get from it. And it's this, God rules history in righteousness. We are not surprised by God's judgments. I thought that was really well said. All right. I'm out of time. If you got questions, just hang out. We'll talk. But I got to dismiss us. But I won't go anywhere. And because um, we got to get Maggie and the choir on their way. So I'm glad you're here tonight. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. And thank you for the encouragement tonight. Uh, your word is amazing. And Father, so continue to give us a passion for it, a desire for it. Uh, may we sincerely seek it in its wisdom. And Lord, thank you that we are reminded tonight that you are the God of history. This is your story. Nothing happens uh, without your knowledge, your purpose, your providence. And we're so glad we can be confident in that. So Lord, even in our darkest of times or when we look around and things seem bleak, uh, when things seem so opposed to you, Lord, let us never lose heart that you are on the throne. Lord, you have purpose and you've just called us to be faithful. So let us be faithful. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen.